Audiobook, Simply This Moment. 6. The Opening of the Lotus. 3rd of May 2000. This is the first talk I have given since teaching the annual 9-day retreat for the local A Buddhists. I always have a wonderful time on those retreats. It is a time when all my attention is focused on meditation and on the Dhamma. One of the things that became very clear to me on that retreat was that there is no difference between the Dhamma and meditation. One should incorporate as much Dhamma as possible into the way one meditates. If you can incorporate all your understanding of the Dhamma into the meditation, then this is a very powerful and effective way to gain the goal in Buddhism. I find it's not possible to separate these two things. Thinking that meditation is somehow separate from the teaching of the Buddha, or that the teachings of the Buddha are somehow separate from the meditation practice, will not lead to success. The Dhamma and meditation go together so beautifully. One of the things I tout regularly to the lay meditators during the retreat was, when you are meditating, remember the basic teachings of the Buddha. The Teflon mind. Keep the Dhamma in mind as you are meditating, particularly keep in mind the four noble truths as an indication of what you should be doing when you are meditating. In particular I focused their attention on the second and third noble truths. The second noble truth is craving or more especially kamataha, the craving for the five sense world, the craving to be, which includes the craving to do, and the craving for annihilation. These invariably lead to dukkha, to suffering. So how can you expect to become peaceful or get into a deep meditation when you are following the path of the second noble truth? You can only get into deep meditation if you remember the third noble truth, which is the ending of that craving. The path to Nibbana. The path to Nibbana is the path to the highest bliss, the highest peace, and it is achieved through Kagapa in East Agamadhyana Laya. These the four Pali words mean giving up, Kaga is giving away, Pa in Isaga is renouncing, forfeiting. Muddy is releasing and Analeya is not letting anything find a roosting place in your mind, not having a place where things can stick. I told someone this evening that, with a Teflon mind the thoughts and ideas don't stick, they just slip away. With these Dhamma teachings in the mind it becomes very easy to succeed in meditation. You understand what you are doing and that helps the meditation. You begin to understand what it is you are doing that is obstructing success in the meditation. As far as this meditation is concerned, if you really practice the third noble truth, if you really do let go without exception, freely opening up and not having a place where things can stick in the mind, you will find the mind opens up and becomes very peaceful and quiet. The mind goes through the stages of meditation, all the way into the jhanas. It's the natural unfolding of the peaceful mind. So often when we're practicing our meditation, we are following the second noble truth instead, that is craving. It is concern for things in the world, and thoughts about the past and the future. It is thoughts about family, thoughts about our health. Thoughts about our comfort and our bodies, thoughts about the sounds that other people are making, thoughts about heat and cold, thoughts about what you're going to do tomorrow, thoughts about when you are going to do it, and where you are going to go. All of those thoughts are the concerns of the five sense world. In Pali they are Kamataha, craving for comfort, for satisfaction, for fulfillment for success in the world of the five senses. We should know now from our own experience and through the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha, the Four Noble Truths, that this concern is not the way of peace, of happiness, or of release in one's meditation. It will only produce more 
suffering, more frustration, more disappointment, and more pain in the mind. This is what is meant by cause and effect. We know where this path will lead us if we follow it. So we should know that whenever there is pain, frustration, or despair in the mind we have to work back to find the craving which is the cause. Learn from your mistakes. Learn from the wrong attitudes of the mind. Don't be foolish and generate suffering, 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 for your whole life and through many lives, through many world cycles. Don't be stupid, learn from experience. If it's suffering, if it's despair, frustration, disappointment, or whatever, it is something to do with the first noble truth. The craving to be always comes from the illusion of self, Ada. People often have very strong egos and a very strong sense of self from pride. They are the ones who find it very difficult to meditate. Sometimes one needs to develop humility, the ability to surrender. I notice that people who have enormous faith are usually the ones who have an easier time doing the meditation. They get into deep states of meditation because of faith in the teaching and faith in the teacher. Faith in the Buddha is something that overcomes faith in one's ego. Everyone has some sort of faith, some sort of belief, but so often it is belief in oneself, in one's own wisdom, in one's own intelligence, in one's own knowledge and that very often obstructs the progress on the path. When I teach retreats I often see this. Some of the Asian meditators are able to go far deeper in their meditation, because generally speaking they trust what a monk says. They don't argue with it, they don't think twice about it, they just do it. They follow the instructions and it works. In contrast many Westerners are so independent. Basically so conceited and arrogant, that sometimes we don't want to follow what the teacher says, or what the Buddha says. We want to find out in our own way what we think must be right. When one is not yet a stream winner that belief in one's own ideas and views is very uncertain, it creates so much of a burden, so much of an obstacle in your monastic life. Be careful what you put your faith in. As you know, faith or sada is one of the five spiritual qualities, the five indrayas. It's very important to have faith at the beginning of your practice because you haven't grown in pana, in wisdom yet. When one has gained wisdom, then that faith is confirmed. You are stronger in the faith because you have seen the truth for yourself. Ajahn. Chen used to say that when you have been a monk for five years you have five per cent of wisdom. Someone asked, does that mean when you have four years as a monk that you have four percent wisdom? He said, no, when you've got four years you've got zero wisdom. What he said was very wise, if you've got zero wisdom you have to accept it and do as you are told. Trust in a John Chan duel. Go much further than if you trust in yourself. I've seen that degree of faith, that degree of surrender, in some of the Asian meditators and because of that they follow instructions without question. It's amazing that with some Westerners things often go wrong with the tools and equipment they buy because they don't read the instructions before they plug in and start using them. That's the arrogance of people these days, they think that they are so superior, they think they know it all. They have faith in their own abilities and that's why they are always falling on their faces. A person who truly has faith would read the instructions, understand those instructions, and if there were any questions would read it again until they understood the instructions, and then they would proceed. The Instructions are very clear, craving leads to suffering, letting go leads to peace. So what do people do when they try to meditate? They crave to get peaceful. They work hard to get peaceful, they strive, 
and they screw their minds up to get peaceful. And then they just get frustrated and think, I can't meditate. It's true that you can't. Meditate. No Atta, no self, can do the meditation, you have got to get out of the way. Put the eye aside and then you find that meditation happens. You can do meditation, you've got to just get out of the way for meditation to occur. It's a whole process and that's precisely what the second noble truth means. It was amazing to see in the retreat how stubborn people are. They will always try and do things. One of the most powerful methods of meditation that I practice is contentment. I don't teach things and then do something else. All of the methods that I teach are the methods I practice myself. Contentment means being happy to be here, wherever you are. The reason contentment works is because it's going against the second noble truth and it's fulfilling the third noble truth. You have to be careful of contentment because it doesn't mean being content to follow the cravings and the damn qualities of the mind. It's a different type of contentment. I always know when it's real contentment because I don't move. If I was not content then I would always be looking for happiness somewhere else. That's the opposite of contentment. Discontent causes restlessness, causes movement of the mind, and causes craving, reaching out and trying to find something else to feed the needs of the mind. If it's discontent you get kama chanda, sensual desire, the first hindrance. You want to find some better comfort, something happier and more pleasant, you want to get rid of the pain in the body. Kama chanda comes from discontent. Discontent is ill will, it is not being happy with the meditation, with yourself or with anybody else. From discontent people often go into sloth and to warp or just to escape, because they can't face the present moment or the present life. One extra hour in bed in the morning means one hour less you have to meditate or one hour less you have to face the cold world. Restlessness, worry, or remorse are obviously discontent, doubt is discontent, as is the desire to know, to figure things out, shut up and be peaceful. You know everything you need to know. All the five hindrances are born of discontent. In the Nalakapanasada MN68, it says that only when you achieve the jhanas are the five hindrances, and interestingly discontent and weariness overcome. It's interesting in that sada to see that the Buddha linked the five hindrances and discontent, and how the five hindrances plus discontent give rise to weariness, aunt heaviness in the body. Weariness makes it so hard to drag yourself out of bed in the morning, out from under those nice warm covers. If our meditation is going well, if we have overcome the five hindrances, we have energy and the heaviness of the body disappears. During the retreat it was often hard for me to stop skipping around the place, because when you are enjoying yourself you want to get up earlier and earlier. That's just the way of the body and the mind. When the mind has energy it is no longer weary. Discontent is at the heart of the five hindrances, and it's also at the heart of the second noble truth. From discontent craving arises. So check your meditation. Ask yourself, am I content where I am? Or do I really want to get quickly into a jhana? Do I really want to get quickly through the next stages? Do I really want to get quickly through this? Talk and get somewhere else. Be careful of discontent because it causes so much restlessness, so much inner activity and thinking. I've noticed before that if I'm listening to a beautiful talk it brings me so much happiness. I'm silent inside because I don't need to speak, because the talk is so beautiful. I'm just listening to it and getting high, having a wonderful time. But if we don't like the talk, 
or discontent comes into the mind, then we start thinking, fantasizing, dreaming, or falling asleep. Discontent has moved us away from what is happening. We all make use of escape. Mechanisms that we've stupidly built up over lifetimes rather than face the present. Rather than face what's happening now. We are always trying to run away, that's restlessness. That habit can very easily manifest in our meditation, instead of facing up to what's happening, and developing contentment in the moment, people run away. They run away into thinking, philosophizing, dreaming, and fantasizing. That's not the way to meditate. That's the second noble truth and it only leads to suffering. You should know that by now. Following the instructions. Follow the third noble truth of letting go. When we sakaga or generosity, we are giving up and abandoning, that means surrendering, forsaking, pa and isaga. What do we have to forsake? We have to forsake our old views, ideas and conceits. This is hard to do because we are so stubborn. One of the monks, sitting in with me during the retreat interviews, asked me, why do you think it is that people come on retreat and get all these good results, when sometimes monks at the monastery can meditate for years and not even experience an amida? Some of the people on retreat lead very busy lives. They don't have much time to meditate, certainly not as much as the monks in Danagarikas. In the monastery you only have to do two hours work on five days of the week, whereas these people work 40, 50, or 60 hours a week, plus all the other business they have to do. In those nine days of meditation it was amazing to see how many of them achieved decent meditations and even had nimittas arise. So I said, it's because some of the monks are stubborn and that's quite true. Sometimes instead of just listening and following the instructions, so often we want to make our own instructions. Instead of listening to what the Buddha said we want to interpret it to suit our own ideas. That's the stubbornness in Westerners. And I can understand it because you have to be stubborn to become monks in the first place. You have to go against the stream of the world to become a monk, so that stubbornness is sometimes inherent in monks. Nevertheless, if one uses one's intelligence and experience to overcome that stubbornness, to just be happy with simple duties, to renounce and to let go, then you can get into deep meditation. But you have to renounce and let go stage by stage. That's why I teach meditation in stages. Let go of the past and the future, just be in the present. By the simple process of being in the present moment, so much restlessness, so much thinking, and so much of the craving stops. I'm not only saying this about a novice meditation or a preliminary meditation, if I were to say things like that people would think, oh, I'm much more advanced than that, I'm going to do the deeper meditation not present moment awareness, that's kid stuff. I still do present moment awareness meditation myself. I employ it at all stages of meditation. It's wonderful how powerful it is. On the retreat I also taught Akata Siddha, this mind that has gone to one peak off being, one peak in space, one point in space. Instead of looking at it that way, look at this meditation of Akata Siddha as being one peak or one point in time. Focus not in space but in this moment in time, centered in the peak of this moment, right in the middle of past and future. If you look at Ekata as one pointedness in time you will get much deeper in your meditation. You will really understand what this meditation is all about rather than have some sort of spacious awareness or focusing your attention on the tip of something. This is where you can get into beautiful 
contentment, just by being in the moment. If you are fully aware in the moment, silence emerges from within the present moment. You don't need to go looking for something else, or move on to the next stage of meditation. You move into the next stage of meditation or rather the next stage of the meditation moves into you. But watch it, if you let go you will experience mati, which means freeing, opening up. The Buddha said that as a teacher, he had a mighty fist, an open fist, he didn't keep anything secret. One way to understand what that Pali word means is, instead of gripping the meditation object in your fist, you just open it up. That's mati, that's release, that's openness. That's the reason when people open themselves up to the breath, to the silence or to the present moment. They begin to get some understanding of the third noble truth. You are not controlling, you are not manipulating, and you are not doing so much anymore. All that controlling, manipulating, doing, is part of the craving to be. Craving is born of the illusion of mind, mind to control, and mind to order. Leave. All that alone, that only leads to suffering, to pain, to more discontent more craving and suffering. It's a vicious cycle that we can get into. Discontent producing craving. Craving producing dukkha, suffering, and suffering and discontent produces more craving. It's so hard to let go. Once you find the let go button, you will find that in the present moment silence just emerges from within. The Buddha used the simile of cool water for the jhanas. Cool water doesn't come from the north, south, east or west of the lake, it comes from within a spring in the middle of the lake, drenching the pool with this beautiful cool water. That simile applies to all stages of the meditation. You just have to stay in the present moment. And this beautiful silence wells up from within that experience, within that moment, within that mind. It comes from within and cools everything down, it makes everything so silent. Skillful meditators have the experience that they don't make the mind silent, the silence just arrives. You will find that you cannot make the mind silent, you cannot do that. I can't meditate to gain silence, the I has to go away. Silence comes in its own time, when you are ready. When you've settled down enough, not doing anything, then muddy means that the claws of the mind have opened up enough so that the silence can come in. Then in that silence, if you wait long enough, the breath will arise, especially if you have done meditation on the breath before. You have done meditation on the breath before. You have done meditation on the breath before. You have done.